So let's suppose then that Jesus had such an experience. But you see, Jesus has a limitation that he doesn't know of any religion other than those of the immediate Near East. He might know something about Egyptian religion, a little bit maybe about Greek religion, but mostly about Hebrew. There is no evidence whatsoever that he knew anything about India or China. And we people who think, you know, Jesus was God, assume that he must have known because he would have been omniscient. No. Uh, St. Paul makes it perfectly clear in the epistle to the Philippians that Jesus renounced his divine powers so as to be man. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought not equality with God a thing to be hung on to, but humbled himself and made himself of no reputation and was found in fashion as a man and became obedient to death. Theologians call that kenosis, which means self-emptying. So, obviously, an omnipotent and omniscient man would not really be a man. So even if you take the very orthodox Catholic doctrine of the nature of Christ, that he was both true God and true man, you must say that for true God to be united with true man, true God has to make a voluntary renunciation for the time being of omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence for that matter. Now therefore, if Jesus were to come right out and say, I am the Son of God, that's like saying I'm the boss's son. Or I am the boss. And everybody immediately says that is blasphemy. That is subversion. That is trying to introduce democracy into the kingdom of heaven. That is, you are a usurper of the throne. No man has seen God. Now, Jesus in his exoteric teaching, as recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, was pretty cagey about this. He didn't come right out there and say, I and the Father are one. Instead, he identified himself with the Messiah described in the second part of the prophet Isaiah. The suffering servant who was despised and rejected of men. And this man is the, the non-political Messiah, in other words. It was convenient to make that identification, even though it would get him into trouble. But to his elect disciples, as recorded in St. John, he came right out and said, before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. I and the Father are one, and he who has seen me has seen the Father. And there can be no mistaking that language. So the Jews found out, and they put him to death, or had him put to death, for blasphemy. This is no cause for any special antagonism to the Jews. We would do exactly the same thing. It's always done. It happened to one of the great Sufi mystics in Persia who had the same experience.
Now what happened? The apostles didn't quite get the point. They were awed by the miracles of Jesus. They worshipped him as people do worship gurus. And it's, you know, to what lengths that can go if you've been around guru land. And so the Christians said, okay, okay, Jesus of Nazareth was the son of God, but let it stop right there. Nobody else. So what happened was that Jesus was pedestalized. He was put in a position that was safely upstairs. So that his troublesome experience of cosmic consciousness would not come and cause other people to be a nuisance. And those who have had this experience and expressed it during those times when the church had political power were almost invariably persecuted. Gordiano Bruno was burnt at the stake. John Scotus Origina was excommunicated. Meister Eckhart's theses were condemned. And so on and so on. A few mystics got away with it because they used cautious language. But you see what happens. If you pedestalize Jesus, you strangle the gospel at birth. And it has been the tradition in both the Catholic Church and in Protestantism to pass off what I will call an emasculated gospel. Gospel means good news. And I cannot for the life of me think what is the good news about the gospel as ordinarily handed down. Because look here. Here is the revelation of God in Christ, in Jesus. And we are supposed to follow his life and example without having the unique advantage of being the boss's son. Now, the, the tradition both Catholic and Protestant fundamentalist, represents Jesus to us as a freak, born of a virgin, knowing he is the Son of God, having the power of miracles, knowing that basically it's impossible to kill him, and he's going to rise again in the end. And we are asked to take up our cross and follow him when we don't know that about ourselves at all. So what happens is this. We are delivered, therefore, a gospel which is in fact an impossible religion. It's impossible to follow the way of Christ. All right. Many a Christian has admitted it. I am a miserable sinner. I fall far short of the example of Christ. But do you realize, the more you say that, the better you are. Because what happened was that Christianity institutionalized guilt as a virtue. You see, you can never come up to it. Never. And therefore, you will always be aware of your shortcomings. And so the more shortcomings you feel, the more, in other words, you are aware of the vast abyss between Christ and yourself. You will have your opportunity to speak in the question period, madam. So, you go to confession. <laughs> And if you've got a nice, dear, understanding confessor, he won't get angry with it, you. He'll say, my child, you know you've sinned very grievously, but you must realize that the love of God and of our Lord is infinite, and that uh, naturally you are forgiven, 
As a token of thanksgiving, say three Hail Marys. And you know, you've committed a murder and robbed a bank and fornicated around and so on. And the priest is perfectly patient and quiet. Well, you feel awful. Think, I have done that. To the love of God, I have wounded Jesus, grieved the Holy Spirit, and so on. But you know in the back of your mind that you're going to do it all over again. You won't be able to help yourself. You'll try. But there's always a greater and greater sense of guilt. Now, the lady objected that I was putting up a straw man and knocking it down. This is the Christianity of most people. Now there is a much more subtle Christianity of the theologians, the mystics and the philosophers. But it's not what gets preached from the pulpit. Grant you. But the message of Billy Graham is approximately what I've given you. And of all what I will call fundamentalist forms of Catholicism and Protestantism. What would the real gospel be? The real good news is not simply that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, but that he was a powerful Son of God who came to open everybody's eyes to the fact that you are too. And this is perfectly plain. If you will go to the 10th chapter of St. John, verse 30, there is the passage where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And this is, there are some people who are not intimate disciples around, and they're horrified. And they immediately pick up stones to stone him. He says, many good works I have shown you from the Father, and for which of these do you stone me? And they said, for a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. And he replied, isn't it written in your law, I have said you are gods? He's quoting the 82nd Psalm. Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If God called then those to whom he gave his word, gods, and you can't deny the scriptures. How can you say I blaspheme? Because I said, I am a son of God. Well, there's the whole thing in a nutshell. Because if you read the King James Bible that descended with the angel, you will see in italics in front of these words, son of God, the son of God, because I said, I am the son of God. And most people think that the italics are for emphasis. They're not. The italics indicate words interpolated by the translators. You will not find that in the Greek. The Greek says, a son of God. So it seems to me here perfectly plain that Jesus is got it in the back of his mind that this isn't something peculiar to himself. So when he says, I am the way, no man comes to the Father but by me. This I am, this me, is the divine in us, which in Hebrew would be called the Ruach Adonai. This a great deal of made of this by the esoteric Jews, the Kabbalists and the Hasidim. The Ruach is the breath which God breathed into the nostrils of Adam. It is differing from the soul. The individual soul in Hebrew is called nefesh. And so we translate the ruach into the Greek penephma and the nefesh into psyche or psyche. The spirit, and you ask a theologian what's the difference between the soul and the spirit and he won't be able to tell you. But it's very clear in St. Paul's writings. So the point is that the ruach is the divine in the creature, 
by virtue of which we are sons of or of the nature of God manifestations of the divine this discovery is the gospel that is the good news but this has been perpetually repressed throughout the history of Western religion because all Western religions have taken the form of celestial monarchies and therefore have discouraged democracy in the kingdom of heaven until as a consequence of the teaching of the German and Flemish mystics in the 15th century there began to be such movements as the Anabaptists the brothers of the free spirit and the levelers and the Quakers a spiritual movement which came to this country and founded a republic and not a monarchy and how could you say that a republic is the best form of government if you think that the universe is a monarchy obviously if God is top on a monarchy monarchy is the best form of government but you see ever so many citizens of this republic think they ought to believe that the universe is a monarchy and therefore they are always at odds with the republic it is from principally white racist Christians that we have the threat of fascism in this country because you see they have a religion which is militant which is not the religion of Jesus which was the realization of divine sonship but the religion about Jesus which pedestalizes him and which says only this man of all the sons of woman was divine and you had better recognize it and so it speaks of itself as the church militant the onward Christian soldiers marching us to war utterly exclusive convinced in advance of examining the doctrines of any other religion that is, is the top religion and so it becomes a freak religion just as it has made a freak of Jesus an unnatural man it claims uniqueness not realizing that what it does teach would be far more credible if it were truly Catholic that is to say restated again the truths which have been known from time immemorial which have appeared in all the great cultures of the world but even very liberal Protestants still want to say somehow so as I suppose to keep the mission effort going or to pay off the mortgage yes these other religions are very good God has no doubt revealed himself through Buddha and Lao Tzu but now obviously it is a matter of temperament you can be loyal to Jesus just as you're loyal to your own country but you are not serving your country if you think that it's necessarily the best of all possible countries that is doing a disservice to your country it is refusing to be critical where criticism is proper so of religion every religion should be self-critical otherwise it soon degenerates into a self-righteous hypocrisy if then we can see this that Jesus speaks not from the situation of a historical Deus Ex Machina, a kind of uh, weird, extraordinary event. But he is a voice 
which joins with other voices that have said in every place and time, wake up, man, wake up and realize who you are. Now, I don't think you see until churches get with that, that they're going to have very much relevance. You see, uh, popular Protestantism and popular Catholicism will tell you nothing about mystical religion. The message of the preacher, 52 Sundays a year, is dear people be good. We've heard it ad nauseam. Or believe in this. He may occasionally give a sermon on what happens after death or the nature of God. But basically, the sermon is be good. But how? As St. Paul said, to will is present with me. But how to do that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, that I, I do not. And the evil that I would not, that I do. How are we going to be changed? Obviously, there cannot be a vitality of religion without vital religious experience. And that's something much more than emoting over singing onward Christian soldiers. But you see, what happens in our ecclesiastical goings-on is that we, we run a talking shop. We pray, we tell God what to do, or give advice, as if he didn't know. We read the scriptures, and remember talking of the Bible, Jesus said, you search the scriptures daily, for in them you think you have life. St. Paul made some rather funny references about the spirit which giveth life and the letter which kills. I think the Bible ought to be ceremoniously and reverently burned every Easter. We need it no more because the Spirit is with us. It's a dangerous book. And to worship it is, of course, a far more dangerous idolatry than bowing down to images of wood and stone. Because you can, nobody in his senses can confuse a wooden image with God, but you can very easily confuse a set of ideas with God because concepts are more rarefied and abstract. So with this endless talking in church, we can preach, but by and large preaching does nothing but excite a sense of anxiety and guilt. And you can't love out of that. No scolding. No rational demonstration of the right way to behave is going to inspire people with love. Something else must happen. Or oh, he'll say, what are we going to do about it? Do about it. You know, have no faith? Be quiet. Even Quakers aren't quiet. They sit in meeting and think. At least some of them do. But supposing we are really quiet, we don't think. Be absolutely silent through and through. Who we'll say, well, you would just fall into a blank. Oh, ever tried? I feel then, you see, that it's enormously important that churches stop being talking shops. They become centers of contemplation. What is contemplation? Contemplum. It's what you do in the temple. You don't come to the temple to chatter. But to be still and know that I am God. And this is why if the Christian religion, if the gospel of Christ is to mean anything at all, instead of just being one of the forgotten religions along with Osiris and Mithra, we must see Christ as the great mystic. In the proper sense of the word mystic, not someone who has all sorts of magical powers and understands spirits and so on, 
A mystic, strictly speaking, is one who realizes union with God by whatever name. This seems to me the crux and message of the gospel. Summed up in the prayer of Jesus, which St. John records, as he speaks over his disciples praying that they may be one, even as you, Father, and I are one, that they may be all one. All realize this divine sonship or oneness, basic identity with the eternal energy of the universe and the love that moves the sun and other stars.